title of my message this morning is that you might believe. I just want to say a God bless you to our brother and sister here this morning. God bless you. We love you. Mama, Stanley, God bless you. Good to have you with us. I want you to notice something in that video we just watched. You say, well, why do you have to have a video just to introduce your message? Because there's some, there's some meaning behind it. When Jesus stooped down and he put this dirt on his eyes, he said to him, go and wash thyself in the pool of Shalom. Let me ask you this question. Did you see the man hesitate? Did you see the man talk about his faith? Did you see the man question Jesus on why he needed to go down to the pool and wash his eyes? See, many today have a philosophy that, well, if God wants to heal me, he'll heal me right where I am. But how many know that faith without works is dead? You can say you have faith all you want to. But sometimes God will make you get up out of your seat and do an act of faith. Now see, this man, did, he wasn't asked. Jesus didn't ask him, do you believe? He didn't ask him, do you have faith? He went up to him and he put the mud on his eyes and said, go. He gave him a command. And I believe that in that command, as he was moving, the Holy Ghost was moving to bring the healing power of Jesus upon him. And when he went into the water and he took that water and he washed the first time, he didn't stop and say, well, I did it, but it didn't happen. He took a second time and he went and he washed again and, 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 and it came, the healing of this man that was born blind. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John. Chapter 20. Verse 30 and 31. And I'm going to be calling on some of you to come up and read some Scripture as we go through the process of what we're going to be learning this morning. So uh, just be ready and be obedient. Don't fight it. Just come up and read it. Chapter 20, please, verse 30 and 31. We all know the Gospel of John was written by John, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says here in verse 30 that and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. In some of the other gospels you may see some. But there's also a scripture that says if he, we were to record all the miracles that Jesus did, there would not be enough books in the world to contain them. There were things that Jesus did and people that were healed that are not written in the Bible. Only these that were written were written for a purpose. And in verse 31, we see the purpose come to life. But these, say these, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Hallelujah. And I want anyone to know who's watching by Facebook, we want to say God bless you for joining us this morning. Those up in Maine, those in India, Pakistan, China, or anywhere else in the world, you may be tuning into this broadcast. You say, I want proof that Jesus is real. I want proof that Jesus is alive. I want proof that Jesus is who he says he is. Well, these scriptures here tell us these things were written that you, may that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, not that he 
might be the Christ, but that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Hallelujah. So I don't care if you're Muslim. I don't care if you're Buddhist. I don't care if you're some other foreign religion. Let me tell you this. Your Quran might say one thing. Another book may say another thing. But I want you to know that this book right here, it says these things were written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hallelujah. But there's also a promise with that. It says, and that believing, you might have life through his name. The quotation here, or, or the, the phrase I should say here, but these are written. What was written? We're talking about the signs. These three words, signs, belief, and life, provide the logical arrangement of this gospel. In the signs we see a revealing of God. In belief, the reaction that these should suggest. And in the life is the result that belief conveys. In these two sentences, there are three main points of words, and they are signs. The word sign means samia in the Greek, which is a miracle. So we know that these miracles were done, these signs were done, that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then we have the word believe. In the Greek, the word believe is pasto. According to Merrill C. Tinney in he states in his commentary the following. I want to quote him. Word believe, it usually means acknowledgement of some personal claim or even a complete personal commitment to some ideal or person. So the word believe is not just something that you confess. Oh, I believe. So many people say they believe, but they don't believe. Let me say this, it may shock you, I don't know, it may not, or it may. But just believing doesn't make you a Christian. The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. And I don't know of any demon that's saved. They believe. When they saw Jesus, they said, who art thou, Christ, Jesus, you come to suffer, you know, cause us to suffer before our time? They know who he is. Those demons existed way beyond the, the times that we live in now. Those demons were alive during the time of Jesus. They're still alive today. Those demons that went into the pigs are still alive today. They don't die. They're still alive. And let me tell you, there are so many demons that follow us every single day that try to convince us that believing is simple, just say a prayer. But I like Tierney's explanation and definition of the word believe. A complete personal commitment to a person. Hallelujah. So believing means that you are committed. And then thirdly, life comes from the Greek word zo. And in John 17, verse 3, he gives us the definition of this life. He says this. And this is life eternal. Same word, so this is this is life. This is life. That they might know thee. Now, this word know is not the Gnostic no. Just a knowledge, just a head knowledge. 
We can all say that we know he was born in Bethlehem. We can all say that he was a Nazarite. We can all say the historical things. But this word no is an intimate knowledge. You might remember in Genesis it says, and Adam knew his wife. That didn't mean he just, hey, how you doing? How are you? No, it meant that he had a sexual intercourse, a close relationship with his wife. And in a sense, it's that intimacy. This is eternal life, that they may know, have that intimate relationship. They may know thee, the only true God, an intimate relationship with God, knowing who he is, knowing how he acts, knowing what he does, knowing what he desires, wanting to fulfill his will. It's an experiential knowledge, not just a head knowledge, not just a bunch of facts and information in your head, but it's something spiritual. There's a connection spiritually like the Bible says, a man and a woman, the two become one flesh. There's an intimacy of relationship with God. That I might know thee, thee, only true God. Hallelujah. The only true God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's known as El Elyon. Adonai, El Shaddai, Hello, Boshakara Mahanda. Nowhere in Scripture is the Allah. This is not a derogatory thing against Muslims. They only know what they're taught through Ishmael and through Muhammad. But we have the actual recordings, divinely inspired. Gospel. And this is eternal life that you might know that the only true God and this is a subordinating conjunction. It doesn't mean very true God and Jesus Christ. They'll say, see, now Jesus is not God. No. Because of this conjunction, it brings the two together. Jesus is God. In human flesh. That you may know the only true God and Jesus Christ. Whom thou hast sent. He didn't come on his own. He didn't decide to come. He was sent by God. And there was a purpose of why he was sent. And that purpose was. For God so loved the world that he gave or he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes is committed with that intimate relationship with him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Everlasting soul. Hallelujah. This is life eternal. That they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now when we read the scriptures, we, we sort of read them, but we don't really examine them. We, we kind of just read them and take the information in. But there are some things in there that are so prepared. It's like going to a buffet. And you have all of these trays with covers on them all the way down the line. And you only go to the first one, you lift it up. You never tasted it, so you put it down. You go, But there are so much good stuff there. You need to try. You need to lift up the thing, try a little of this, try a little of that, try a little of this. And so there are so much more in these scriptures. And we're going to look at these signs, these wonders. These were given that you might know. Well, what can we know about the, the healings? What can we know about the miracles? There's so much. 
We're going to look at the seven signs in the gospel that show certain characteristics of Jesus' power and person. We will look at these as they occurred in order. Number one, the changing of water into wine. I need someone to come up here right now and read John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. Someone come on up quickly. Don't, 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 uh, don't dilly-dally because we've got a lot of time here. Come on, somebody. Come on up here. Okay. John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to manner of per, uh, per purification of Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and he filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast, and he took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. The beginning of signs Jesus did in Can of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thank you. Praise the Lord. This miracle of changing the water into wine. Everybody focuses on wine. Well, Jesus was a, was a bartender. No. The changing of the water into wine. Here Jesus reveals himself as the master of quality. The master of quality. What he does is the best. Come on, somebody. He's a master of quality. He could have made just the same wine as the, uh, they had served, but he made the best. They said, you have saved the best for last. So Jesus is the master of quality. How many know that he likes quality? He doesn't do things haphazard. That's why I refuse to give a suit that's soiled or, or torn away to somebody. Because if Jesus is motivating for me to do it, I don't want to do it with a soiled half. In fact, I went, cleaned out my closet. I got maybe eight or ten suits that I no longer wear simply because somehow the cleaners shrunk them. And I made sure they were okay, they were clean. And then I gave them away. He's the master of of quality. Think about it. Does God do anything halfway? No. He's a master of quality. Now that doesn't mean that he'll give you the top best of everything. But he'll give you something of quality. Hallelujah. 
He's the master of it. I love that about Jesus. How many like nice things? How many like to wear just somebody's old stuff? We don't. God makes sure that when, we, when people give, they give with a whole heart and they give the best they can give. It's the same way with your offerings. God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because he wants quality. The quality of your offering is cheerfulness. Not, oh boy, I've got to write this check again. And you're grudgingly given to God. Boy, I could use that. I'm going out camping this week, or I'm going out doing this this week, or that this week, and I could really use that money for that. God loves it cheerful. He loves quality. The Bible says that you are to present your body as a living sacrifice. Why? Why? anyone knows the answer, please yell it out. Why? It's what? Quality. But why is it quality? Because the Bible says that your body is not your own. You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body. It doesn't belong to you. It's not your life. Don't sit there as a Christian and say, it's my life, I'll do what I want to do. If that's what your philosophy is, then you need to examine your Christianity. Your Christianity is knowing God, the one true God. These things were written that you may know. The one true God, and the one true God requires everything 100% of your commitment to him. Jesus said, if you will not take up your cross daily and follow me, you are not worthy of me. You are not worthy of this salvation. Why? Because of quality. But you don't understand. He, if I do that, he's going to take everything away. No. He'll take everything away, but he'll replace it with something better. He took away the old so that he could bring on the new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And the new is better than the old. You'll have peace like a river. You'll have joy, unspeakable and full of glory. The second miracle he had done was the healing of the nobleman's son. I need someone to come up and read for me. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. Come on, somebody quickly. Don't hesitate or I'll call you. Come on, somebody, come up. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. Come on. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Is that it? Or? 46 to 54. Oh, okay. 46 to 54. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea, he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down here, my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth unto him. And, he, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. 
And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Yes. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. I was in Capernaum in Israel. The second miracle that he did, he did. The healing of this nobleman's son. Here Jesus shows himself mastery over distance and space. These things were written that you may know. Not only is he the master of quality, but when he heals you, he doesn't heal you halfway. He heal you all the way. Sometimes it's progressive, yes. Sometimes it's instantaneous. But the healing of this nobleman's son shows to us that Jesus is master over distance and space. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's still the master of distance and space and can still heal today as he did when he walked on the earth. Because he is the master over distance and space. He proved it right here in this particular portion of scripture. He didn't even have to go. The man was healed the very same hour. So that shows that Jesus is the master. Sometimes, how many times you pray, you say, Lord, you're way up in heaven. Can you hear me? You know, I've been praying for this thing and it's not coming. Lord, is are you taking your time? Is something wrong? He's the master of time and space. These things were written that you may know. Have an experiential knowledge of this. That he is the master of space and time. Nothing will persuade us different. Thirdly, the third miracle he did, these are all in the scriptural order, is when he healed the impotent man. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 9. I need someone to come up and read that for me. If you can't come up, I'll bring the microphone to you. But Someone to read Matthew 5, 1 to 9. I'm John. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, John. 5, 1 to 9. Someone. Come on up. Come on, hurry, hurry up. Thank you. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called the Hebrew tongue um, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, fir then first, after the troubling, of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Wow. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man 
when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here, this impotent man was healed. As I said before, sometimes it's gradual, but sometimes it's immediate. This was one of those immediate times. Jesus here shows himself as the master of time. He's the master of time. That's why it's so important for you and I to not have lost our faith when things seem to take a little bit more time than we think it should. Because when you know God, when you know these things that were written, when you know them, that He is the master of time, that He does things in quality, that He does things, hallelujah, over distance in space, and that everything he does is on time. Amen. Hallelujah. We sing that song. He's an on-time God. Oh, yes, he is. He's an on-time God. And so throw your watch away when he doesn't seem to come in your timetable because he is the master of time. Hallelujah. Give the, God, give the Lord a clap offering, if you will. He's the master of time. Oh, man, when things don't come our time and our way, we want to give up. We want to run the other way. But he's the master of time. Aren't you glad? Oh, hallelujah. The fourth miracle he did was the feeding of the 5,000. Can I tell you, Linda and I, we stood on the same mount and the spot that they believe is where Jesus sat and dispensed and fed 5,000 with two loaves and three fishes. Five loaves and three fishes, right? Yeah, five loaves and three fishes. Think about that. In the math math mathematical realm, that doesn't make sense. How can you feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? Someone come up and read this for me. John chapter 6, verse 1 to 14. Come on, who would like to come up and read that? Come on, Jimmy. While you're up here, say hi to your sister. Your sister's watching in Maine. Hello, Lynn. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lift up his eyes and saw a great company unto him, come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and we had given thanks. He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. 
Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which we made over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is the truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Amen. Thank you, brother. I need to be corrected. I said there were five loaves and two fishes. No, there were five loaves and two small fishes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's make the miracle a little tougher. Five loaves and two small fish. What this shows us, what this teaches us, is that now Jesus is the master of quantity. He's the master of quantity. He always provides enough. Hallelujah. He took these five loaves, and it was so interesting because Linda and I, we were on the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias. We, we stayed, our hotel was in Tiberias. We stayed there. When you go there, it'll change your life. It brings everything in the Bible to life. And they brought us to the place where Jesus fed the 5,000. You know, you want to weep. You want to cry because it's so alive. It's so real. But he is the master. Of quality, he is the master over distance and space. So if you have a need in India, he can provide from heaven your need. If you have a need in America, he's the God of time and distance. He's the master. He can bring it. Even if he has to bring a raven to supply it. God will do it. I'm hoping I have time. He's the master of quantity. When I was with Youth with a Mission, we did a play called Toymaker and Son. I was a sound director. I did all the sound equipment. And we went to New Hampshire to raise some funds. We went through the United States, but we went up to New Hampshire, Maine, and then we came back down to Concord, uh, New Hampshire. We stayed there for a while. Then we traveled all through the United States down into uh, Guat uh, Guatemala, Mexico. And we went to this church, and I guess they didn't know we were going to be so many. We had like 30, 30 people that would come on a bus. And so they made very little. They made this little, they had this little crock pot about this big. Full of sloppy joe mix. They had the buns over here. And they said, please, we don't know if there'll be enough. Just take one. And we prayed. And the woman took the co cover off, started putting one. One, one went through the, and plus, on, on, uh, and remember, there's 30 of us, but it was church people too. So there must have been about 55, 60 people. So she took the one, everyone took one, and she looked in the pot, she said, oh, there's more. If you want seconds, come up. All of us went for seconds. After we were through, she looked, she said, oh, there's more. We all had thirds. I'm telling you, and they said, we don't know how this can be, except it be a miracle. He's the God of quantity. The fifth miracle, please give me a little time. The fifth miracle is the walking on the water in John 6, 16 to 21. I need someone quickly to come up here and read this. 
Come on. John 6. 16 to 21. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea towards Ephraim. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind and blew. So when they had row about five and twenty or thirty furlocks, furlock, furlock, yeah. furlocks, I'm sorry, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drew nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land, whither they went. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. This particular miracle, Remember now, these things were written that we may know. May know him. That this scripture shows the mastery over natural law. He's master over the natural law of things. I'll never forget this testimony. You all remember Larry Hickey, Pastor Larry Hickey? He came here, him and Karen, short little guy, kind of stocky, bald head. Larry Hickey, Pastor. He'll, he'll be here sometime in October, I believe. He's coming again. Well, he was here, and, and he had a church before I was married in Monroe Bay, Virginia. He told me of a the story of how when he first went there, they were building this church. It was on a bay. It was Monroe Bay Assembly of God. And he gave the testimony that as they were building this church, that they needed to get the cement in that particular day that it was going to be delivered. And so the um, one of the men in the church said to him, Pastor, we need to we need to stop the delivery of the cement. Because if you look, you see the clouds coming from the bay this way. It's rain. If we pour that cement, it's going to ruin the cement. And we'll have to buy the cement all over again. So he stayed still for a moment. He said, no. He said, don't call the cement guys. He said, let's pray. And all the workers got together and they held hands and they prayed. They said, Lord, you know we need the cement. It's coming now. Lord, please, do something for us so that the cement doesn't get wet. They no, no sooner prayed that prayer, the cement truck pulled up. They poured the, the foundation to the church. The guy said, listen, he said, if we pour this, there's no guarantee. If it rains, you're, you're on your own. They said, we believe God's going to do something. This is a true story. When he comes, you can ask him this. He said, they poured the cement, they left. He said, the clouds were coming. He said, then the raindrops started coming. Closer and closer. He said, all of a sudden, he said, that big, thick black cloud split right down the middle, half to the left, half to the right, and right where his foundation was, was sun, but to the left was rain, to the right was rain. This is a true story of a miracle of God who has the quality and the mastery over natural laws. If you don't think so, you ain't going in the rapture because gravity says you stay down. He is the master. The natural laws. Then we have the sixth miracle he did. The one we saw in the, uh, in the video. The healing of the man that was born blind. 
And they asked him a question. His disciples asked a question. He said, Master, was this man born blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? Then Jesus said, Neither had this man's sin nor his parents' sin. Now, if we stop there, many of the critics of the Bible say, See, that's a contradiction in the Bible. Because in Romans it says, For all have sinned. And Jesus is saying that his parents or him never sinned. That's not a contradiction when you take it in context. He asked the question, did this man sin or his parents sin for the reason why he's born blind? Jesus answered the question, said, neither his father and mother have sinned nor he have sinned in regards and context to why this man was blind. But his father and mother and he was a sinner just like everybody else. So be careful when interpreting the Bible. I'm not going to have someone come read the sixth one because we kind of saw it on the video. But this shows that he is the master over misfortune. He's the master of misfortune. Sometimes things just happen. Yep, John 9, 1 to 12. He's the master over misfortune. Now, I'm so glad that I'm honest with my wife. Now, my wife has a new CRV Honda, you know that, when she got into an accident with the Toyota. So we have a new Toyota CRV 2016, beautiful car. I was having my car detailed yesterday by my neighbor, so I had to take her car to a class that I'm attending with the police department. And so they were, they were um, training us and showing us how these new technologies on how they find Alzheimer's patients with dementia. They have a bracelet, and then they have a radio frequency thing that they can find somebody when they're missing. So we went out to the cemetery, and we were, we were you know, trying to find these, these little things that his, one of his uh, workers put out there beforehand. We didn't know where they were. And believe me, we found all three of them very quickly. Really, really, really interesting. But anyway, so we were, I, after it was all over, I was getting into the car, Linda's car, and at the cemetery, I don't know if you notice that, but there's a, sometimes when you round the corner, there's a little stone like this square, and it has like a dome top to it. I didn't see it. And the front wheel went right over, and I heard, <laughs> and I was just, oh, no. And I got out, and I looked, and all of the plastic on the bottom of the door was from, from like about a foot was pulled off. The, 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 uh, Mud flap was pulled off. And I said, oh my God. I said, I can't tell Linda. She'll kill me. So I said, Lord, I said, Lord, what am I going to do? He said, take her to the hospital. How many know if you obey the voice of God? So I took her to the Honda place. There was nobody there. No customers ahead of me. So he said, pull it right in. So I pulled it right in. He looked, took it off. He said, yeah, you broke the clip off on the first one. I said, well, I said well, if you want, we can order the whole thing. But he said, let me look at it. So he took it off. He tapped it in. It didn't fit. He put the thing back. No damage. To the door, to the metal, nothing. I'm here. I'm sitting there thinking 200, 300, 400, 500. And when, I, when he was done snapping, he said, if it, it doesn't work, he said, I can always order you one because there's no problem. So I was driving home, right? The little voice said, don't tell Linda. <laughs> what she don't know, don't hurt her. And I said, no, I'm going to tell her. And I told her she was so loving to me. Oh, she was so kind. She slapped me in the back. <laughs> she understood. She said, it's okay. And I told her, I said, you go out and look. You can't even tell her. Praise God. Hallelujah. He shows the mastery over natural loss. He does. The sixth one was the healing of the, born, the man born blind of misfortune. The seventh one was the raising of Lazarus. In chapter 11, verses 1 to 46. I'm not going to have anyone read that because that will take forever to read. 46 verses. You know the story. They call for Jesus. I'll paraphrase so it can kind of go a little quicker. 
They call for Jesus. Je Jesus, come. Your friend, say friend. Lazarus is dead. He's dying. Come. Come heal him. And the Bible says that Jesus took extra time. He took extra time. He did what he was supposed to do where he was. And then when he show, finally shows up, they had already buried Lazarus. They already rolled a stone in front of his grave. They already put the grave clothes on him. And then Lazarus' sister came running. Oh, master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She was accusing him of not caring. He said, be of good cheer. He'll rise again. She goes, well, I know, Lord, he's going to rise again in the resurrection. I mean, smart Alex, she was. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You know, as you get older, sometimes you think about, well, how much time do I have left? You know, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you, know, you really don't think about that too much. But when you get into your 60s and 70s and on in the 80s and so forth, you start to think and say, okay, Lord, how much time do I have left? And you know, we don't have to fear death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is thy victory, O grave? For if we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And so the seventh miracle he did, the raising of Lazarus, shows that he is the master over death. So we know he's the master of physical death, right? We know that he is the master of the physical death. That's why in the spiritual, you don't have to be afraid to lay down your life for Christ. Some people are afraid. I remember um, Sarah, who used to come to our church. She used to tell me all the time, I'm afraid to commit my life to Christ because of what it might cost me. I'm afraid to fully commit to Christ because I'm I don't I don't know what he's going to ask me to give up. He might tell me to go to Africa and, and I can't do that. You don't have to be afraid of that death either. You don't have to be afraid of taking up the cross and following after Christ. You don't have to be afraid, as the Apostle Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You don't have to be afraid of that death because God will give you the quality, the quantity, hallelujah, of the, of, of the, uh, of the life that you will live in this life, which will far better outseed anything that you could have accomplished in your life. When I first started out as a Christian, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that God would take this person from New Bedford to different parts of the world. Never thought that I would be a pastor of a church. Never thought that I would be a, a, um, a chaplain for the Fairhaven Fire and Police Department. Never thought for a moment I'd be a constable in the city of New Bedford. Never thought for a moment that God would open the doors that he's opened in my life through people that I have met along the way at conferences in different places that I've never solicited myself, never promoted myself, but they came over to me and said, I want you to come. Brother Yari's coming from Africa. He's coming. He's in, he's in America right now. He's in Baltimore. But he'll be coming in uh, the, the 18th, 19th, 18th. He'll be coming on the 18th, Bishop Iyari. He came to me. He said, the Lord's telling me to invite you to Nigeria. 
I had been two previous times with another organization. That door closed. When one door closes, God opens another door. And so he came to me and said, I want you to come to Nigeria. I've been there five times now. So let's go real quick over the seven miracles. Number one, when he turned the water into wine, it reveals that he's the master of quality. Number two, the healing of the nobleman's son, it shows Jesus is master over distance and space. Remember, these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. These things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. The healing of the impotent man, he's the master of time. The feeding of the 5,000, he's the master of quantity. The walking on the water shows he's the mas he is mastery over natural law. The healing of the, blonde, uh, the, born, the man born blind shows he's the master over misfortune. And number seven, the rising of Lazarus shows that he is the master over death. These signs were written so that you would believe. You would believe, have a complete personal commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. See, the ones that Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you, were the ones that only had a head knowledge of God, and you can tell the ones that have a head knowledge, they have very little commitment. Those are the ones that have head knowledge. But the ones that really have a commitment, they want to be intimate with you. They want to have a relationship with you. They want to read the Word because it's His Word. It's life to their soul. The Word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. If I want to know what God has for my life, I don't need to have somebody come give me a word. I have it right here. And if someone comes and gives me a word, it's already something that's been committed to me by the Holy Spirit. And that word is just a confirmation of the word I've already received. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. I'm going to read it again. The Bible says that without faith, remember, faith is not just a profession. Faith isn't something that you put out in the air that's empty. Faith always has an object. When you sit in that chair, that object, you're believing that when you sit down, it's going to hold you up. Because of the ability of that chair and the way it was constructed. Faith in God. Without faith in God, in these things, especially this morning that we're talking about, believing that He is master over time and space, meaning that he knows all about your situation. He knows all about what you're going through. And that He can deliver you. Whatever your situation, God can and will have compassion to those that may be going through some of these life situations. But remember this. God knows everything that is going on in your life. And He wants you to not doubt, but to believe. Receive and know that He loves you and cares about you and what you're going through. In His time, in His way, 
not yours or mine, will God show himself faithful to you. Because he, because that is who he is. He is faithful. Let's bow our heads for a moment. The title of my message that you might believe. Pastor Tom, will you play that song that's up here? That you might be as faithful. In my moments of fear, through every pain, there's someone here this morning or someone watching by Facebook. You say, Pastor, there's things that I've been waiting for, things that have been bothering me, physical infirmities, whatever it may be, that seems to be hindering. While you've been praying, it has been a hindrance. It seems like God is taking forever. Still in He's proved faithful. I want you to take a step of faith. Me. I want you to come forward. I'm going to pray with you. Is true. What I thought was impossible, I've seen my God. anyone else? Remember the man born blind from his mother's womb? Didn't do anything to deserve that blindness. But Jesus said, now go and wash in the pool of shalom. And he immediately went to that step of faith. Healed. Is there anyone else? Thank you, brother. You may need deliverance. This is your day. He's the master. The Bible says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be many times I could not pray. Still my God, he was faithful to me. All the days I spent so selfishly reaching out for what pleased me. Oh, the Holy Spirit's going to come right now. I sense it right now. I sense it right now. He's going to touch you right now. Let everyone here praying, please. Put your hands, bring your hands to us. He is waiting with open arms. And I see one.
through every pain, every tear. There's a God who's been faithful all on to me. When my strength was all gone, when my heart had no song, he's a faithful. Still in love, he's proved faithful to me. Every word he's promised is true. What I thought was impossible, I've seen my God do. He's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking He's been faithful, faithful, He's faithful. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the Spirit of God. Thank you that he lives the life. Thank you that he's holy with him and his wife. I've seen it for myself, Lord. This is a walk I've never had to see in my life. Some people are living the right, the right in Jesus. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their commitment to stay here. Thank you, Lord, for the word today. Thank you for everything that we that we saw today. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Greet one another before you leave.